Hey there, I am Hoosier Boo, and uh, I'm still alive. Um, and it's uh, it's been a while since I picked up this camera and recorded something. Uh, it's actually been you know, two, three months now. And that has been because of the absolutely globally devastating coronavirus pandemic. Uh, it's been a really tough time all over the place. Uh, I've been way, way, way more fortunate than most people have. Uh, so I'm very grateful of that. But uh, one thing I haven't been able to do is travel. I have been trying to stay safe and responsible. I don't want it. I don't want any of my family getting it. I don't want to spread it to other people. So I have not really uh, been anywhere uh, outside my house for all this time. Uh, but it's now mid-May. Uh, it's actually just as dangerous as it was back in like March. Actually a lot more. Uh, but I thought I needed to get out and that it'd be safe to visit a few places uh, that were, you know, pretty safe, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And uh, look what I found. I found an old railroad viaduct. So I am really out in the boondocks. Been taking some one lane roads for quite a few miles. And here is a wooden bridge with uh, some iron trusses supporting it. You do have to drive over this wooden bridge. There's a 12 ton weight limit. And it uh, seems pretty sturdy to me. Not sure how old this is. Uh, but when you go over, you can see that the bridge is above the railroad tracks. There's also some roosters somewhere over there. This is the view of the tracks as they head into Osgood, Indiana, which is a few miles to the west there. And over there is the railroad viaduct. And we're gonna see if we can get a closer view of that. Now I found a closer vantage point to the railroad viaduct. It is called the High Bridge Viaduct and was built here in 1901. Uh, this is around the original route of the Cincinnati and Missouri Railroad. I don't know if that was the official company name, but it connected Cincinnati and St. Louis. Uh, and that was built back in the 1850s. The route was a little different than this. Uh, they decided to reroute the route around 1900, and they decided they needed to go over uh, Lowry Creek here, and uh, they needed a bridge viaduct to do that. So that's what they did. This thing was built in just 26 days. About 150 men worked on it. And uh, I think there are 44 pillars. You can't get a full view of it because of all the foliage, but uh, that, that is very impressive. That's been up there for 119 years. That's pretty cool. This is about the closest angle I can get of it uh, because I, I think I am on private property. Um, there's barbed wire. Uh, so can't see more, I'm not gonna try to climb on it. Also during World War I, this viaduct was guarded by the army. And then World War II, it was guarded by the civilian army corps. Now I do know the railroad is still active. Uh, trains do regularly pass through the town of Osgood, Indiana. Like I said, this is a little east of there. I'm not sure if this viaduct is still used, but I also don't know where any other tracks are, so uh, this might actually still be used. Trains might pass over this. So this was a neat little stop. Glad to finally see something. That's quite relieving. Uh, but I'm gonna go head to a quite familiar town that I have been to and filmed before. Um, but I'm just gonna go check how things are, so let's hit the road.
in Vivi, Indiana. I have made some videos here before and uh, we're going to take a look at the courthouse here. The Switzerland County Courthouse is closed to public access. It looks like they haven't even made any payments in this box. This box has never been here before. I wanted to stop by here again, even though I made a video here less than a year ago, is because they got a new monument here. This is the Switzerland County Bison. So uh, 2016 was the bicentennial of the state of Indiana, and one way the state celebrated was uh, by giving all the counties and uh, some other people some bisons, and then each county painted their bison themed on their county's history, culture, nature, whatever they wanted. So uh, they just put him up in late 2019. And as you can see, uh, they have grapes. Uh, Vivi in Switzerland County uh, was one of the first places wine was cultivated in the United States way back in like 1802, 1803. And Vivi is home to the Swiss Wine Festival in late August. I have been in 2018 and 2019, I have videos on both. It's a really fun festival. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I don't know the status uh, if it's happening this year, uh, possibly not. Uh, so it may sadly be the first year without a Swiss wine festival, but uh, they do have a bison now. You can see it was called the Bison Tennial Public Art Project. And I've been finding these bisons all across Indiana the past couple of years. Uh, they were all at the state fair in 2016, didn't make a video on it that year. That was really before I started making videos uh, successfully, so I didn't there. Uh, but I've been seeing them all over the place now, so it's very cool to see Switzerland counties finally out in front of the courthouse. And also on the courthouse grounds is the old 1854 VV jail. Uh, and this was used up until the 1960s. Uh, the new jail is behind it. And uh, you can actually go inside this abandoned jail. All right, please don't have Corona in here. Uh, there's a chair, that's new. Uh, looks like they might not want people going inside right now, which is understandable. Uh, I did go into it in my VV video, gave a little more history. Uh, I think I'm going to respect the chair and not go in at the moment. Right in front of the Baptist church is the infamous six-sided privy. This was one of the most luxurious outhouses in the country during its heyday. And here it still sits on the courthouse lawn. Well, this is a fairly quiet town, even here at the main intersection of Main and Ferry. Uh, it, it's dead, like... Some of the businesses are open. Uh, luckily, Switzerland County has largely been spared from the coronavirus, but so not not much going on. It's like there isn't much going on anywhere right now. All right, I'm here at one of my favorite restaurants in the world, Roxano's. Uh, it is obviously closed, but I am getting carry out. All right, mission accomplished. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, Roxano's is one of the greatest restaurants in all of history. Um, I like eating there, but uh, we just have to make do with the situation. So I got the breadsticks here. They they are freaking amazing, and I also got a cheese quesadilla. All right, I'm now at Paul Ogle Park on the riverfront. This is the site of the Swiss Wine Festival, and for the rest of the year, it's just a community park here. Uh, as you can see, it is all closed off. Those gazebos over there are closed off, and this is the playground I spent plenty of time here as a child. Um, yeah, it's totally roped off. All the equipment, swings, the pirate ship, basketball courts over there. Everything is roped off. Looks like that barge by the giant Kentucky power plants is docking. See, it is moving a little bit, it's turning. Gonna dock over there. Here are the 80 foot tall VV flood poles. Looks like the water's about 28 feet high based on that, so we're not flooding yet. 
needs to be about 48 to be in a flood panic mode. The Ohio River is definitely a bit up at the moment. Uh, I found this, I think this staircase used to lead to a boat ramp. And uh, it's just kind of sitting out here now. Um, but I, I think it goes a good ways down. Usually the, the river should be uh, like 15, 20 feet lower than it is right now. I'm not sure how much river traffic and river trade has been disrupted by the coronavirus. I suppose it is a slightly safer means of transportation. But I can confirm there are vessels voyaging down the Ohio River even during the pandemic. So uh, that's nice to see. There's a coal barge. There's a very old grindstone with a mighty Ohio behind it. This here is a poo shack. A wooden structure that's fairly old and dilapidated. It was probably used for storage. Uh, not sure when this was built. Pretty old. And it appears to be filled with junk. And that's a toilet. Alright, it's time to get back on the road. I have a few more stops planned. So let's go. in Versailles, Indiana, at the Bel Air Drive-In Movie Theater. This is a roadside relic that was opened in 1952. You can see the uh, screen over there where they project the movies. And I think that's like the snack stand. Most drive-ins I've been to have had snack stands. Never seen a movie here. Even though I've passed by here like a hundred times. And I wanted to show the sign here because while well, of course the drive-in is uh, currently closed, even though I guess this would be safer than an actual movie theater, uh, they are apparently having uh, church services here in cars instead of movies. So you can see the Shelby Christian Church, Mom's Does Service spelled wrong Sunday. 
Um, <laughs> not sure what that's supposed to mean. Uh, but yeah, apparently on Sundays, they've been having cars drive in here. You can see the uh, ticket booth over there. I believe this one's only cash only when it's open in the summer. And uh, cars can park up and uh, listen to some churching. It's a better look at the screen of the old drive-in theater. It is a very fun experience. I highly recommend that you do it uh, if you have one near you. Uh, but I gotta say, Spud Drive-In Theater, Driggs, Idaho, definitely my favorite. stopped off at a funeral home in North Vernon, Indiana, and in that gazebo over there, they have a hearse. Right in here is a classy 1914 horse-drawn hearse. See it's in the glass, there's a little glare. And it's the uh, hearses for their automobiles uh, were hand-carved, very beautifully done. And uh, this one was used somewhere in the area, not here in North Vernon, but this funeral home got a hold of it and uh, they restored it. And apparently at this funeral home, you can actually arrange to have this horse-drawn hearse used in your funeral. It could take your body to the cemetery. Well, that, <laughs> that, that's a pretty cool opportunity. I mean, may as well, right? I'm sure that's not expensive at all to arrange this. Well, it looks like right now inside the hearse there is a, uh, a box casket draped with an American flag. I assume no one's actually in there. And also in the gazebo is another casket with uh, some hats on it. Again, I presume uh, no one's being stored in there temporarily. I'm not sure if they're allowed to do that. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty cool relic. This is the back side of the hearse. And outside the funeral home, there's a little water fountain memorial. Just a hearse in a gazebo. Not something you find every day. I'm now in Vernon, Indiana, at the Jennings County Courthouse. Just like in VV, court is not in session here either. Here's a Millennium Time Capsule that is to be opened in 2100. Here's a little plaque on the small town of Vernon, Indiana. It's historic district, the courthouse square here, a few other buildings. There's a 1895 True North 
South Meridian Stone. Morgan's Raiders during the Civil War came right through Vernon on July 11th. Colonel Williams here of the Indiana Legion, which was just old civilians basically who tried to defend this place, said that Morgan must take it by hard fighting and uh, no battle occurred. This county is named after Jonathan Jennings, the first governor of the state of Indiana. Uh, his grave in Charlestown, Indiana is not too far from here. I have a video on that. He's a pretty interesting guy, so uh, go check that out. Speaking of dead Indiana governor's graves, I am now in Hayden, Indiana at the Hayden Cemetery. And this town was the birthplace and is now the burial site of Governor Edgar Wickham, who is also one of Indiana's most colorful governors. And here is the grave of Governor Edgar Dowd Wickham. As I mentioned, he was born here in Hayden on November 6th, 1917. And despite this fairly plain gravestone, uh, he has quite a history to him. I'll start off with his World War II service. He was sent to the Pacific in 1941 and was sent to the Philippines, specifically Corregidor. He was at one of the bases there and during the Philippine campaign of the Japanese, they overran all the American bases. And uh, of course the bases, they were overpowered. So they had to surrender. Um, which actually kind of worse because the Japanese found surrender dishonorable, didn't have much of a use for them, and the Japanese infamously uh, treated their prisoners of war horribly. So when Wickham was captured along with everyone else, uh, he was beaten and tortured, but he managed to escape. But then he was recaptured a few days later, but then he managed to escape a second time, and that's where things get really interesting. He managed to evade hunters for days, but then he knew he had to get out, so what he ended up doing was extremely daring. He swam across shark infested waters all night to an area of Bataan that was unoccupied by the Japanese military. And then after that he managed to find safe passage to China and he was finally able to contact and be saved by the United States in December of 1943. And uh, he also wrote a really famous book about his incredible experience called Escape from Corregidor. After his incredibly brave service in World War II, he came back to Indiana and went to law school at Indiana University. Then he practiced law in Seymour, and then he decided to enter politics. He served in the state senate and the general assembly, and ended up secretary of state. In 1968, he was nominated to run for governor at the contentious state republican convention that year, which put him up against minority leader Otis Bowen, but Wickham edged out the nomination and won the governor's seat that year. One of the first things Wickham did was redistrict Indiana. From my understanding more fairly because his redistricting created more districts for urban areas. This actually ended up causing a lot more infighting among the Republicans as rural and urban desires are often different. While Wickham was from a rural area, Bowen, who had a lot more power now, represented an urban district so they had a lot more issues with each other throughout his term. The state also had some budgeting issues but from my understanding, Wickham's administration was able to increase tax revenue by 8% without raising taxes on any level. They did that by simply changing some collecting and auditing methods, finding where taxpayer money was being wasted and was spent unnecessarily and was lost. And I do think that still desperately needs to be done at federal, state, and local level even today. Though I never met the governor while he was alive, my great-grandfather knew Wickham and was actually his deputy commissioner of labor during his term Otis Bowen started supporting that the governor's primary be held by the actual electorate and not at the convention. And uh, in 1872, the next governor's election, Otis Bowen was able to secure the nomination and uh, he did win the governor's race, uh, which got Wickham out of power. Uh, Wickham did run in 1876 for the senator seat that was available at that time, but again, he was defeated in the Republican primary by popular Indianapolis Mayor Richard Luger. So uh, that basically ended his political career. Wickham went back to practicing law around here, but after that, uh, some believe he started having some mental issues. He ended up divorcing his wife, uh, not Mary Evelyn, they married like three years before he died. But Wickham picked up sailing, uh, and he just decided he was just gonna sail all the time. First, he sailed around the Mediterranean Sea, then he sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, and then in 1995, he started sailing around the world. He was able to complete this task, however, uh, his ship got stuck on a reef in the Gulf of Suez, and uh, he did have to abandon his ship, sadly. 
but then he retired to a small cabin overlooking the Ohio River in the Hoosier National Forest, and he died fairly recently on February 4th, 2016. And he is now buried here in the tiny town of Hayden, Indiana, where he was born 104 years ago. And here in the small town of Hayden is this new monument to Governor Wickham. I had not known about this. This is a really freaking awesome monument. You can see uh, limestone Indiana with Wickham's likeness in the center. This site commemorates his World War II service. And on this bronze plaque here, you can see how far he had to swim from Cregator to Bataan through shark infested waters at night. And this site commemorates his sailing voyage, circumnavigating the world at age 71 in a 30 foot sailboat. Here's a really old gas station. This might be old, old Route 50 along here. Not sure how old this is, but it's probably from the 20s to 30s. That seems to be well restored. So that was my quarantine adventure. Oh, uh, by the way, I have uh, I've not shaved for like uh, a month and a half now, so uh, I'm growing a beard now. Uh, but anyways, today's been great. Uh, it's felt so freaking nice uh, to just go explore a few things, even if everything is actually closed. Um, seen some outdoor stuff, uh, just driving around a little bit. Uh, it's been quite a while. I've been deprived of my needs. So uh, this has been pretty great even if it wasn't too far out. Um, if you like this video, I have other videos at Abandoned Stuff, Historic Sites, uh, other stuff while it's open. And uh, hopefully this will all be over soon. Uh, probably not. Now if you're watching this pretty soon after I release this video, uh, I do have a lot of other videos uh, that are going to be coming out slowly. Those are all videos that I filmed a while back, uh, several months ago, that I plan to release sporadically. I was planning on being a little farther ahead, more prepared, uh, but I've uh, missed out on some pretty great adventures. I am still going to miss out on some uh, really, really uh, cool stuff that I was looking forward to. Um, so I've slashed my upload schedule, but I still will have content slowly pouring out that I still had available. I'm glad I saved all that. Um, but anyways, thank you for watching.